discipline. Uh, just hearing the Word makes us almost nauseous, doesn't it? One that's even worse than that is this church discipline. Oh, even the church doesn't want to hear about that. Therefore, this morning we began a study of discipline, didn't we? And in that lesson, we talked about discipline in a very broad and general way. We did three things in that lesson. Number one, we looked at the definition of discipline. And very simply, it means instruction. And that instruction is designed for numerous purposes, but mainly to make us better individuals. We look second at many of the methods of discipline. Teaching is just one of them, isn't it? We can go all the way from just a simple look, being disciplinary to the very fact that God brings harsh judgments upon His people in order to discipline them. And there are all kinds of methods in between those that we studied. And then we also examine some of the purposes of discipline in general. During this hour, we're going to be much more focused on an area of discipline, and it's church discipline. And we're going to be looking at four points in the course of this lesson. Again, it falls under a very broad title entitled, A Spiritual Family That Disciplines. If we are the children of God, our Father expects us to discipline her members when they are needed. Point number one. What are the causes of church discipline? As I was thinking about these causes, there are three main causes for church discipline. Number one, individuals who become lazy and slothful in their Christian service are a cause for discipline. We turn to Matthew, the 25th chapter. And there we read of a parable that is known as the parable of the talents. A man is going to go on a trip and he divides his goods unto his servants. One gets five talents, another gets two talents, and another gets one talent. Two of those men do well, don't they? The five-talent man and the two-talent man, they work, they labor diligently, and they increase their talents. In fact, they double their talents, and upon the return of their Lord, they present those to Him and are commended. But then there's a one-talent man. Rather than laboring and toiling and using that talent and increasing it, he hides it in the earth, doesn't he? And when his Lord comes again... He presents that one talent back to his master. And listen to the words of the master. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. My friends, if there is anything that our God does not want in His service, are wicked, slothful, lazy individuals. The Bible tells us that Jesus died in order to purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous, fervent in good works. Titus 2 verse 14. The Bible tells us also that our God wants us to be individuals who bear not just a little fruit, He wants us bearing much fruit for His cause, according to John 15 verse 8. And the indolent... And the slothful, God has no tolerance for. But there's a second group of individuals who need to be disciplined. And that, those are those individuals who get caught up in sin and in iniquity again. Now we're not talking about the occasional sin that an individual commits. All Christians are going to do that. And when they sin, when they transgress the will of God, they go to God and they ask prayers and for, for or prayers of forgiveness, don't they? 
We're talking about that person who gets caught up in sin again, gets caught up in the world again. And Peter writes about him in 2 Peter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, and the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Here are Christians who've escaped the pollutions of the world. They become children of God, but then they get tangled up again in those sins, in the iniquity, in the worldly things of life. Peter says that latter state is worse than the state they were in before they ever became a Christian. There's a third category of individuals who need to face church discipline, and those are the individuals who adhere to false doctrine. And there's two groups of individuals who adhere to false doctrine. One group adheres to it and proclaims it. Another group adheres to it and doesn't necessarily proclaim it, but they practice it. And Peter writes about both in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Notice what he says, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there also shall be false teachers among you, who privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There are going to be individuals who will arise in the church who teach false doctrine. Individuals who teach things contrary to what is found in the pages of this book. And Peter warns against those individuals. But notice verse 2 of that text. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. It amazes me how many individuals will reject truth to accept error. It amazes me how skillfully a false teacher can come in and change the minds of individuals who have been Christians for years and years and years to accept something that is just as false as it can possibly be. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. So those are the three large categories of individuals who need church discipline. Individuals who are lazy and slothful and who refuse to do the will of God. Individuals who are caught up again in sin and in the affairs of this world. And individuals who are caught up in false doctrine. Now let's notice that the New Testament teaches very plainly that these three groups of individuals need to be disciplined. This is point number two, the New Testament and church discipline. Notice point number one, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6. Paul says this, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Now watch this next statement. And not after the tradition which he received of us. Now we could spend a whole day talking about that verse. There's two things we'll point out though. Number one, notice he talks about individuals who walk disorderly. That's a military term. In the military, an army is taught to march, are they not? And when they march, they are supposed to march in step with one another, aren't they? You don't have ten of them out here doing their own thing, dancing around, lollygagging, doing whatever they want. And if they do, guess what? There's going to be major problems, isn't there? The commander of that unit, if he sees anybody out of step, he immediately calls attention to it. And he will immediately discipline that individual. And if a rebuke is not enough... There are other forms of discipline, aren't there? But notice that Paul tells us what the standard of our behavior is. The tradition which ye have heard of us. He's talking about the apostolic tradition. The divinely revealed tradition found in the pages of the New Testament. My friends, our lives are supposed to be ordered by the book. 
Our conversation is to be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to live in accordance with the truth. We are to obey the blessed commands of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if any man refuses to do that, Paul says, withdraw from that individual. Don't have any fellowship with that individual. Don't have any participation. Don't have any sharing. Don't have interact, any interaction between you and that person as long as he continues in that state. I want you to go home and I want you to study the context of 2 Thessalonians 3.6. Because in the context, Paul says that there are a group of individuals that I want you to draw, withdraw from, and he's talking about these specifically. People who have quit their jobs and are busybodies. See, in the first century, they thought Jesus was going to come back any minute. Any minute. Well, if he's going to come back within the next day or two, why in the world do I need to work? Well, I tell you what, if I thought Jesus would come back in a month, this old boy would be taking a vacation real quick. Wouldn't you? What's the use of work if Jesus is going to come back in just a couple of days or in a month or two? So they quit their jobs. Well, when you don't have anything to do, guess what you do? You do something. You get involved in other people's business. You become a busybody. And guess what Paul said? Paul says those individuals need to be withdrawn from. Isn't that amazing? Not somebody who forsook the worship. Not somebody who murdered somebody else. Not somebody who was an extortioner in the Lord's church. Busybodies, people who quit their work, withdraw from them, he said. You ever heard of a gossip in the church being withdrawn from? I haven't. Have you? Every, every church has one or two. How do you know that, preacher? Because every time I get hired, I get told who they are. Isn't that amazing? The very moment you get hired, you get told by somebody, hey, you need to be careful, brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so. She knows everything about this church, and she don't mind talking. Everybody knows who they are. And not once have they ever been withdrawn from. And yet, guess what? If they die in that condition, they'll be lost. They're gossips, and the Bible teaches against that. They need to be disciplined is what they need to be. See, this matter is a lot bigger sometimes than what we think. Those individuals who are lazy, slothful, negligent, disobedient to the teachings of the New Testament need to be withdrawn from. Secondly, what about those in sin? 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. Paul says, But now have I written unto you, not to keep company with any man, that if any man that is called a brother be what? A fornicator? Covetous? Idolater? A reviler? An extortioner? Or a drunkard? With such an one, what? No, not to eat. In the context, Paul is only dealing with a fornicator, isn't he? 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2. A man who had begun to have a sexual relationship with his father's wife, most likely his stepmother. But when Paul lays down the apostolic admonition, the apostolic command on what to do with this individual, he lists a host of individuals that are not to be accompanied with if they are in that situation. Doesn't he? Not just fornicators. Individuals who are covetous. Individuals who are idolaters. Individuals who are railers. Drunkards. Murderers. Anybody who is caught up in sin and iniquity and who is practicing it on a regular basis needs to be withdrawn from, Paul says. So there's the second category. But what about the false teacher? Paul addresses them in Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, listen to what he says, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. 
So here are individuals who are teaching things contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Individuals who are teaching false doctrine. Paul says, I want you to mark them. I want you to set your eyes on them. And I want you to avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. Church discipline. Withdraw from them. Do not eat with them. Avoid them. It's tough words, aren't they? And yet churches, if we're going to be obedient to our Lord, have the responsibility of carrying out these instructions given to us. Now the third point is this. What is the purpose of church discipline? We talked about the purposes of discipline in general in our first lesson, and some of them overlap in this lesson. But we need to be reminded of what the purposes are. One of the purposes simply is this, to obey God. What was it that Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6? Now we seat you, brethren. Or now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you what? Withdraw yourselves, he says. It's a command, it's not optional. In Ephesians 5, verses 8 and 9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. If the command to withdraw is there, if I want to go to heaven, then I must obey that command as a member of the body of Christ. Number two, to manifest love for the transgressor. We talked about raising children this morning and disciplining children. Listen to what the Bible says. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him betimes. Proverbs 13, verse 24. If we refuse to discipline someone who is in sin, refuse to discipline someone who is unfaithful, refuse to discipline someone who is teaching and preaching false doctrine, we don't love that person. Love disciplines. Point number four, to restore the sinner. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Folks, there is nothing more precious than saving the soul of a lost person. Nothing more precious than that. And it matters not whether that individual is an alien sinner or whether that individual is a member of the church who has gone back into sin. Both of them stand in need of salvation. We want the individual to come back, don't we? We want the individual to repent. We want the individual to be restored. We want the individual to learn and grow and again be an active part in the body of Christ. Another reason to keep the church pure. The Lord does not want a church that is filled with sin. He does not want a bride who is stained with sin. He wants a pure, unadulterated group of individuals as His bride. That He may present it unto Himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5 verse 27. One thing you and I need to keep in mind as we live our Christian lives is that we are the bride of Christ. And, and our Lord wants us to be just as holy as we possibly can. And it's not easy in an evil world, is it? Notice the next point to warn others about improper behavior. In Acts chapter 5, we have a severe form of church discipline that's issued. And it's not issued by the church, it's issued by God. Two individuals, a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, sell some land in order to provide for the needs of their brethren who are in the city of Jerusalem. 
They bring the money to the apostles. They lay it at the apostles' feet. And they have kept back some of the money. Peter says, is this everything you receive for the land? Yeah, this is everything. And they lied to the Holy Spirit, didn't they? Immediately, Ananias was struck dead. Wow, that's a pretty significant form of discipline, isn't it? His wife comes in just a little bit later. She tells the same story. They have connived with one another, have they not? And guess what happens to her? She drops dead. There's no way they have the ability to repent. And there's no way for them to correct their actions. They're gone. So what's the purpose of the discipline? Verses 5 and verse 11. Look at verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church, and as many as heard these things. See, the purpose of that discipline was to warn other people. To warn other members of the church. Don't you dare test the apostles. Don't you dare test the power and the ability of the Holy Spirit. Don't you dare lie to your brethren. Because there are severe consequences to that. And the Bible says great fear came upon all the church. Those individuals learned, ain't doing that. Point number four. We don't talk about church discipline that often. And there's some just broad, general points that I believe we need to keep in mind as we talk about church discipline. Number one is this. Church discipline needs to be fair and equitable for all. James 2 verse 9. But if you have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. See, when it comes time to discipline an erring member, sometimes what we do is we have a tendency to base our discipline upon who the person is. Who is he related to in the church? Is he a person of great wealth? Maybe he is an individual who has a lot of influence over a lot of people in the congregation. He's a family member. He's a friend. He's my business associate. You see, it begins to matter not what they've done. It begins to matter simply who they are and who they're related to. It's sad, isn't it? Elderships would be wise to sit down and draw up a plan of action as to how they're going to handle discipline within their congregations. And once they draw that plan up, they would be wise to present that to the congregation. When an individual becomes slothful and lazy and negligent and disobedient, this is what we're going to do. And these are the steps that we're going to take. When an individual gets lost in sin, these are the steps we're going to take. When an individual begins to preach false doctrine, this is what we're going to do. And it doesn't matter who it is. This is the process. And it's fair for everyone. Because sometimes, discipline isn't carried out the same upon all people. How about point number two? Church discipline is supposed to involve the entire body of Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, listen to what he says, In the name of the Lord Jesus, that's by the authority of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus, now listen to him, when ye are what? Gathered together. Why do y'all read these letters of withdrawal of fellowship? When we come together on Sunday morning, because Paul said to. That's why. When you're gathered together with my spirit and with the power of the Lord Jesus to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, 
that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Discipline is supposed to involve the entire body of Christ against this individual who needs disciplining. Yes, the elders are the overseers of that, aren't they? They are the individuals who take the lead in the process, but folks, it is the entire church who is responsible for making certain that the discipline is done on that individual. Number three, most of the time church discipline needs to be carried out a whole lot quicker than it is. We'll get to Ecclesiastes 8.11 in our Bible study, but listen to what it says. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore what? Therefore it is set into the hearts of men to what? To do evil. Here's an individual, he doesn't come to worship for a week, he doesn't come to worship for another week, he doesn't come to worship for another week, he doesn't come to worship for a month, two months, three months, six months, eight months, and a year later, you know, he's pretty unfaithful. We probably need to withdraw from him. <laughs> He'd been gone a year. Hasn't he? See, oftentimes in churches, it takes months and years before they ever do any form of discipline whatsoever. And then we scratch our heads and we wonder why it doesn't work. And we all know as parents that if we just let our kids do whatever they want to for weeks on end, <laughs> not my kid. I may look at them once and they knew after once it's over. And I got some fairly decent kids today. Not perfect, but they're fairly decent. Why don't we understand that in the body of Christ? This is where a plan of action comes in, folks. You see an individual not faithful, immediately the elders go to the plan of action. This is what we do. But it doesn't take one or two or three years to bring about some form of discipline upon an individual. Now here's something that's interesting. Elders. The Bible says that elders are pastors. That little word pastor means shepherds. If I were a shepherd of a literal flock of sheep, and one of my sheep runs off, how long is it going to take me to start searching for it? If you're a good shepherd, the very moment you see that that little sheep is no longer in your fold, you leave the 99 behind and go into the wilderness to do what? Find the sheep. Good elders know the state of their sheep. And if a sheep is gone, elders ought to know that, shouldn't they? And if they know that, they can react and carry out discipline much quicker upon an individual than if they refuse to shepherd as they should. Number four, church discipline does not rule out further admonition toward the individual. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. There's the what? There's the withdrawal fellowship. But listen to what Paul says. Yet, but, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Church discipline is not the final act of discipline. Oh, it's a big act, but it's not the final act of discipline. That individual who's been withdrawn from can be contacted. That individual can be seen out in public. And you get to that individual, you tell that individual, we love you. We want you back. 
You need to get out of your sin. We miss you. You need to repent. You need to come back to the body of Christ. You need to be a faithful servant of God again. And notice the text says, it's a what? An admonition. We studied that in our first lesson this morning. A gentle warning and caution of the individual. Oh no, I can't have fellowship with you. Can't go out to eat with you anymore. But I want you back. I miss you. You need to repent. You see, discipline is not the final action. We can continue to send letters to the person. We can continue to make phone calls to that individual and urge him and beg him to come back. Notice this next one. Church discipline was never intended to bring division to the body of Christ. And it does so, so often. And one of the reasons is because there are some individuals who oppose church discipline. I don't like church discipline. I don't think we should do church discipline. And when it's carried out, they will either side with the sinner or they'll quit the church. Either action splits the church. Did you know that? Either action splits the church. And that's not what church discipline is designed for. There are some individuals who will become bitter enemies of diligent elders or faithful members who carry out church discipline. Sometimes they side with one another in the congregation and the congregation literally is split asunder. Or they just quit that church and go elsewhere. That's not the purpose of church discipline. We need to keep our focus on what discipline's for and it's to save the soul of that lost person. Notice too, church discipline should be made known to area congregations. Now notice this point. There's no direct command for that. We are autonomous congregations, aren't we? We are our own body of individuals. But out of wisdom and out of courtesy, wouldn't it be wonderful to let other people know? Other leaderships in congregations. Because oftentimes, the very moment you withdraw from an individual, he just leaves the church and he goes searching for another congregation. And all of a sudden, he shows up on the doorsteps of another church down the road. Now, if those elders were doing their due diligence, they would quickly find out that that individual had been withdrawn from. What are you doing here? Are you in good standing with the church that you just left? See, there's some questions they need to ask. But we can also head off some of that, can't we? By sending letters to those congregations, and that way when the person shows up, they can look at that person and say, we're sorry. You need to go correct this in your home congregation. Then you can come back and be a member of this congregation. Because if he ever becomes a member of another church, we got problems doubled, don't we? And that's not good. In our homes, we understand the need of discipline, don't we? At least we used to. That's changing somewhat in some homes. And I find it interesting that in our lives, we understand the need for discipline as far as God's disciplining of us as His children. So... Why don't we have the same understanding of discipline in the body of Christ? The Bible tells us that the wise man accepts discipline. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee, the Bible says in Proverbs 9.8. Isn't that something? A wise man will love you if you rebuke him. Not the fool, he'll despise you. But a wise man will love you. 
The Bible also tells us that a good and honest heart that's disciplined will repent of his sins and come back to the church. I find it interesting. We, we always talk about that fornicator in 1 Corinthians 5. and It was a horrible situation. There's no doubt about that. But we need to go into 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And in verse 6, Paul says, Sufficient unto the man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. Isn't that something? Paul says it's enough. You withdrew from him. You had no fellowship with him. You wouldn't eat with him. He wants to come back. And in verse 7, he urges the church to forgive him. You see, there are some individuals that discipline will impact. And those individuals will come back and be faithful to the body of Christ. Now before I leave this subject of discipline, I want you to understand something. Discipline begins with wholesome teaching. The very first point we made in our last lesson when we talked about methods of discipline is the main method is teaching. And if we'll do what we're supposed to do in our teaching, we won't have to do a lot of the other things that we might have to do otherwise. And guess where it begins? It begins in the home. Parents, teach your children Christian values. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let them know we are a godly home. And we're going to raise you the right way. Church, we've got to be focused on the Word of God, don't we? Acts 2 verse 42 says this, And they, that's those first century Christians, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Stories, Contemporary issues, hoopla, all that may be wonderful and pleasing to the ear. We need the Bible, don't we? Churches need to continue in the Word of the living God. That's what they need to do. And as individuals, folks, we've got to keep ourselves in the book, don't we? God could care less about your little flimsy opinion. And your little opinion isn't going to judge you in the last day. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. Colossians 1 verse 27. All God cares about is whether you and I live according to this book. That's what He cares about. And the only way I can learn how to do that is to study the book. But you see, if we'll do a good job teaching in our homes, teaching in the churches, teaching ourselves what God's Word is, we won't have to involve ourselves in very much church discipline as far as withdrawal of fellowship is concerned. It starts with teaching. This lesson that we've talked about, probably one of the hardest lessons to be taught, you know what, in the church. But it is a part of a family, isn't it? If we're the family of God, we've got to talk about discipline. God wants you to be a part of His family. Jesus died on the cross, so you could be a part of that family. And the entrance requirements are simple. Be born again. John 3, verses 3 and 5. If you'll repent of sins, having believed on the name of Jesus, if you'll confess the beautiful name of Christ and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, you can be born into the family of God this morning. Do you need to do that? Dear Christian, where are you in your Christian walk? Just because you haven't been disciplined does not necessarily mean we're faithful, does it? And sometimes we as individuals just need to be honest, confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. And immediately, He restores us to His precious family.
If you need to obey the gospel, won't you come as we stand and sing?